We're starting a new sermon series entitled The Signs of the Time. Everybody say The Signs of the Time. Brother Kevin, Brother Timmy, can you come and help us here this morning? Uh, please take some notebook paper. We have a lot of scriptures, a lot of scriptures to give you in this entire series. And so be mindful of that, that it is a series. Um, in this series, we are going to take our time. Everybody say we're going to take our time. We're going to take our time and dissect the literal end time message. And uh, I am a student of the end time message. I don't know it all, but I, I know quite a bit. I've got that love of the end time message from my father, and I am a student of the end message. But let me say this, and I'm making this commitment to you right here today. I've, been, I've already started it. We are going back over afresh and anew the entire end time message. Is that all right? We're taking it scripture by scripture, and we're seeing if there's anything that we miss. Because how many want the full revelation? I mean, I want the full meal deal, just like Dairy Queen does. I want the Sunday and all. And so uh, we're going back over scripture by scripture and seeing if there's anything that we missed. And so uh, I just encourage you to be here. Uh, I'm really, at this point in time, I'm not even for sure how many messages there will be in the series. Uh, so just stay tuned for that. I know for sure there will be at least, at least, at a bare minimum, three messages, and then we need another day for a video that I want to show you. And so whenever the Lord says we're done, then we'll be done. Is that all right? And uh, let me just say this as we're getting started here today. I want you to understand, uh, how many understand we have a relationship here? We're family, you know, we're the family of God and so on and so forth, but uh, I just want you to understand the level of honesty and character and integrity that you and I share as pastor and congregation. And I'm not saying I'm not saying that to say that I'm perfect or that you're perfect, but I just want you to know that uh, what we're going to say is, as far as I know, beyond what I can study and see and find out, is to be truth. And if there's something that I'm kind of unsure about, I'm going to tell you about that. Is that all right? I'm going to make that disclaimer known. And so I just want you to know that from the get-go as we start this series. Uh, I'm not here trying to sell you my latest book on Bible prophecy. Come on, somebody. Is that good? Do you appreciate this? Uh, you know, I'm not the evangelist who just blows in, blows up, and blows out. Uh, but you can trust what we have to say in this series, and we're going to get into some pretty deep stuff. I'm going to tell you that right now. In fact, we're going to make some bold predictions throughout this series and uh, so just be praying for us that we would find the mind of Christ and be led of the Holy Spirit. And please understand not only the importance of this series, because if you hear one series all year, you need to make it this one. But not only the importance of this series, but also understand that I am totally convinced of what we're sharing. Totally convinced that we are living in the last of the last days. And if, like I said, if there's any confusion or uncertainty about something... I will make that perfectly clear, you know, and, and we're just going to learn and grow together. Is that all right? And while I'm saying that, let me say this. This series is not about the timing of the rapture. We're not going to get into that. Uh, I believe the timing of the rapture, be it pre-trib, uh, mid-trib, or post-trib, I believe that is something we can agree to disagree on. How many would say amen? And personally, I'm still holding out for a pre-tribulation rapture. Come on, somebody. Anybody, anybody want to go before the great tribulation? Man, you can stay if you want to, but I'm out of here. I'm counting on that pre-trib rapture. And if the tribulation starts and we'll, we're still here, then we'll deal with that when it happens, right? We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But uh, let me just say this, and I tell you what, this is this whole series in a nutshell right here. I'm going to give it to you right here. This is it. Probably several weeks of messages, and I'm going to give it to you in one statement. If the rapture of the church doesn't happen very soon, we will be in the tribulation. And so you just want to write that down right now. If the rapture of the church doesn't happen very, very, very soon, we will be in the tribulation. So turn with me, if you would, please, today to the book of Matthew, the 24th chapter. Very familiar passage of Scripture when we're talking of end-time Bible prophecy. In fact, you cannot bypass Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, we'll begin reading at verse number 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the, the disciples came to him, came to Jesus privately saying, tell us when. Everybody say when. Boy, this is the $23,000 question right here. Tell us when will be 
these, when will these things be? And what will be the sign? Everybody say the sign. What will be the sign of your coming? And not only what will be the sign of your coming, but what will be the sign of the end of the age? And that's what we're really going to deal with today, the end of the age. What will be the sign of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. So obviously there must be deception that is coming, right? For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled for all these things. Everybody say for all these things. Not some, not most, but all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are only the beginning of sorrows. Notice that. These are just the beginning of sorrows. Verse number 9, then will uh, deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Boy, isn't that the day and age in which we live now? Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Boy, and that's, that's where we're at right now. The love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Let me, let me read that again. Now, this is Jesus speaking here. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Look at your neighbor this morning and tell him, you better hang on, honey. You better learn to outlast the devil, as Pastor Tom says. Verse number 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then, everybody say then, and then, and not until then, we might add, the end will come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you that this is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we thank you for protecting us and keeping us safe another week. Lord, we thank you that Mama got to come home this week. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. We thank of many others, Lord, that went through things this week. Lord, Sister Charlotte, and you were with her. And we just thank you, God, for your goodness and your faithfulness. Lord, we're so uh, happy to see Sister Donna back with us here this morning. Thank you for all the family of God. And Lord, as we come to this most important time when we break forth the word of life, Father, just captivate our attention right now, Holy Spirit. May our minds be stayed upon you. And Lord, just anoint me. Hide me behind the cross. May I only speak, say, and do what you would have me to speak, say, and do. Lord, anoint our ears to hear and hearts to receive. May the word of God fall on good ground. And Lord, we give you all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. And amen. Once again, the disciples are asking Jesus here in verse number three. They said, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The disciples here were happy or were going to settle for just one sign. But church, can I tell you that you and I are now literally seeing many signs. Many signs. The title of our message this morning comes with a whole bunch of sarcasm. And it's simply this, where are the signs? <laughs> Where are the signs? Can I tell you, if you have been a Christian for any length of time at all, then you know that we are living in the last days. But not only are we living in the last days, but we're living in the last of the last days. I've been searching, praying, studying, looking. One of the things we saw this week was, I believe, guys, if you got that picture of the, the light, in the clouds. Guys, I have never Look at this right here. You can turn it up. You can turn up the video or the Look sound. This is in Costa Rica. Look at the sky. It's absolutely it's like a sign. Now I don't know if you can really appreciate the colors. We'll uh, we'll share this on Facebook after the service. But the clouds are literally beautiful. It is a sight to behold. It just looks like heaven itself. The vast array of colors. Not really for sure what that is. But how many know that the word, word of God talks about signs in the heavens, in the earth, in the stars, in the moon? It's like the Lord is going to come. 
Look at that. It's, it's just, it's beautiful. And so uh, there's just a lot of things happening. I heard tonight, tonight, Sunday night after midnight, if it's not cloudy, you want to get out into the countryside away from the lights as far as you can see and look northward, and we might be able to see the northern lights all the way from here tonight. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? How many, how many believe God's speaking to us? How many believe God's trying to get our attention? Now, how many have heard about the eclipse coming up? Now, I don't have enough for everybody, but if we could just do one per household, Brother James, would you come? And, and if everybody doesn't get one, then share and pass it on. Brother James, would you take those for me, please? But anyway, on August 21st, the date of the great American eclipse, have you heard about it? The hype around it is already getting to a fever pitch. It's also being called the Great American Eclipse because this one will be the first total solar eclipse ever that is only visible in the United States. Now, how many remember the four blood moons a couple years ago? Now, that was important because the lunar eclipse speaks to the nation of Israel, the Jews, because the Jewish calendar is based on the cycles of the moon. But a solar eclipse, which is the sun, is important to us Gentiles because we base our calendar on the rotation or the cycle of the sun. Does everybody understand that? So this, this eclipse is for us. Everybody say it's for us. It's a sign to us. And I'm not going to sit here and read all this, but you can read it when you get it. But get this. The next total eclipse to come to America, guess how long it will be from this eclipse? Seven years. Seven years. Now, if you take the eclipse that's going to happen next month, and this map is on your hand out there, if you take the eclipse that's going to happen next month, it is coming from the northwest going to the southeast. And then the eclipse that's going to happen in seven years from now is going to be coming from the northeast down to the southwest. If you put that X right there, X marks the spot. Guess where it crosses at? Southern Illinois, Tennessee, Missouri, the new Madrin fault line. Seven years from now, X marks the spot. You saying, Pastor Steve, what are you saying? I'm saying we better be watching. We better be praying because we're living in the last days. Okay? So please make sure everybody gets to read this and look at this here. Here's another copy. Anybody didn't get one? All right, here. Pass it around because it is worth reading. But you're going to have to read and pay attention to me at the same time because I'm going to get mad if you don't pay attention to me. I've done a lot of studying for this. Can you read and pay attention at the same time? Where are the signs? Well, I'll tell you where they're at. They're all around us. But Jesus talks about the fact that you can discern the face of the sky. You can tell what the weather's going to be like tomorrow, but you can't even discern the signs of the time. Who was he talking to when he said that? Religious people. Religious people. How many know we have a lot of religious people today that have physical and natural, physical eyesight and natural hearing, but they can't discern the signs of the time? Where are the signs? Well, they're everywhere. They're all around us. And you and I here today in 2017, we are living in the last of the last days. Because in all actuality, the last days started way back on the day of when? The day of Pentecost. That is when the church age began. Now, how many knew that the apostles, and the apostles were disciples, disciples became apostles when? When the Holy Ghost came upon them. As long as Jesus were here, they were followers of Christ. They were disciples. But when the Holy Ghost came upon them and Jesus left, guess what? It was their turn to step up, and that's when they become apostles. Okay? Just a little tidbit there. That was free. But the apostles were looking for Jesus to return in their lifetime. Their lifetime. Did you know that? They were looking for Jesus to return in their lifetime. And we have some scriptures here quickly which prove to us that the apostles were looking for Jesus to return in their lifetime. Let's look at it real quickly. First of all, look what Jesus said to his disciples here in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, 27 and 28. For the Son of Man will come in his glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. 
Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, somebody explain that to me. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, I, I don't know. I don't know exactly. I will say this. It could have been symbolic, meaning the church, because he knew that he was addressing the early church. He knew he was addressing the age in which you and I now live. So prophetically, he could have been speaking to you and I. Symbolically, he could have been speaking to the church as a whole. I don't know. And then Jesus goes on to say this to the chief priest and the Sanhedrin in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, 64. It is as you said, nevertheless, we're reading from the New King James today. I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So once again, he says, we will see him, or they will see him. And then Jesus said this in reference to John the Beloved in John 21, 22. If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So we have some very interesting scriptures here, don't we? And then we read this uh, from the same Apostle John that Jesus was referring to, but now it is John the Revelator. How many understand John the Beloved became John the Revelator? In Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly, everybody say shortly, things which must shortly take place. Now, if I tell you at the close of the service that I'm going to come over to your house shortly, then how many know you're going to go home and start looking for me? Well, Pastor Steve said huh, he's coming over shortly. Okay, do we understand that wording right there? Okay. Now, we could just go on and on, but for the sake of time, we'll stop there. But it's obvious here the, that the apostles really were looking for Jesus to return in their lifetime. And when you look at it on the surface, it might seem a little confusing uh, because some of these scriptures really do make it seem as if Jesus would return uh, in their lifetime. And the only answer I have for that is the fact that God's ways are higher than our ways. Come on, somebody. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And sometimes as human beings, we don't always get the full revelation of what God is doing. How many have found that out so far? That God is bigger than you. How many want to serve a God that is bigger than you? That is smarter than you? Okay. Now, along that same line, notice what the Apostle Paul says here to the church at Corinth over in 1 Corinthians. Because we don't always get the full revelation of everything right, right away. But look at this, 1 Corinthians 13, 9 and 10. Just because we don't completely understand something, that doesn't mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Okay, 1 Corinthians 13, 9 and 10. For we know in part, everybody say part. We just know in part. And we prophesy in part. But when, everybody say but when. Not if, but when. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. So that tells me we're not going to know everything in fullness until Jesus comes back sits us down and explains it to us. That's why we walk by faith and not by sight. All right. Is everybody good so far? We don't always know and see the complete story. We don't always see the, the full picture. And oftentimes, let me say this, oftentimes when it comes to the end times, last days message, chances are that it's a timing issue. Chances are it's a timing issue. Oftentimes we can be few confused on the timing of things and, and why is that? Why are we confused oftentimes on the timing of things? Well, let's look at this, 2 Peter chapter 3, and, and this will kind of help us to explain why we get off on the timing sometimes. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years... And a thousand years is as one day. Everybody understand? 
So now, if that's the case, in which case it is, then Jesus has been gone now for some, what, 2,000 years, but yet only two days in his time. 2,000 years, our time, but only two days, his time. How many see the difference? How many understand that's why sometimes we get confused? And by the way, what happened on the third day? He rose up out of the ground, rose up out of the grave. Whoo! How many know we're, we're living in that third day? We are third day Christians. Honey, if we're not in the third day, we are so close to it. And we're about to get resurrected. Can somebody say? <laughs> Woo, we just missed a good place to shout right there, didn't we? So we don't always get this timing issue. We, we don't always get the timing right down with the end times message. But because of that, that doesn't mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? I know a lot of pastors, preachers, pastors, evangelists, you know, they shy away from the end time message. But can I tell you that's wrong? And I'm not judging anybody. I'm not saying they're sinning. I'm just saying they need to pray about it. And if you don't understand it, what does the Bible say about, what does the book of Revelation say about the book of Revelation? Blessed is he who reads this and understands. So I think we're doing wrong if we just shy away from something because we don't know it and understand it. How many want to learn? How many want to grow? You know, the Bible says study to show yourself approved. And so um, we don't always know, we don't want to always get the time right because of this timing issue. But, but, everybody say but. But with that being said, can I tell you that we have an advantage today, you and I, here today in 2017, we have an advantage because we are living at the close of this dispensation. We Man, now this is a good place to shout right here. We have an advantage that the apostles didn't have. Think about that. The apostles birthed the church age, and now you and I, we get to close the church age. Wow, is that exciting or what? The church at Lincoln. Come on, somebody. Oh, my goodness. I'm about to get ahead of myself. Lord, help me to stay focused. Focused. <sighs> Big deep breath. Now, as we near the end of this age, we will begin to see more and more irrefutable signs. I promise you we will. And we will begin to see things more clearly. We will be begin to see more revelation than any other generation has. Simply because we are living in the last of the last days. And yes, we do have Bible for that statement. Let's look at it here in Daniel chapter 12. I'm not just making that up. I'm not just, I'm not just priming the pump, trying to get you excited about this series. But we have Bible that we are living in the greatest revelation ever known to man. Here it is, Daniel chapter 12, verse number 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until when? Until the time of the end. Now notice it doesn't say until the very end, but seal it up until the time of the end, meaning a period of time. Shut up the words and seal the book until the time or times of the end. And then he goes on to tell us what the end would look like. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now, that's us right now. How many would say amen? That describes to a T the day and age in which we are now living today. Knowledge has increased at an alarming rate over the last 100 years. Do you realize that just since the 1900s, early 1900s, we have went from the horse and buggy age to the automobile to the jet age to the space age to the cell phone? And, man, I'm getting into my next message already. Lord, help me. But it took thousands and thousands and thousands of years for knowledge to increase. And then, since 1900, knowledge has literally exploded. Exploded. 
you say, well, what all, what do you mean? That means we're living in the last of the last days. And we'll get into that later. And we'll prove that through the word of God and so on and so forth. But that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed in this series. But uh, think about this. It says, once again, let me read it. Daniel 12, 4. When he talks about the description of the end time, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now, the last time I heard right, or heard it, uh, if you go out here on the highway, Interstate 55, that wraps around Lincoln, uh, out there by Steak and Shake and Cracker Barrel, but on an average day, there are at least 35,000 vehicles that go by Lincoln, Illinois. Think about that. Not 35,000 people, but 35,000 automobiles. So some of those vehicles have what? Three, four, five people in them. So obviously, people are going to and fro. Just got a, just got a text a little while ago from Sister Becky and Ethan flying out to Florida. Many here today are gone on vacation. Why? Because we're going to and fro. Can I tell you every time you go to and fro, the Pulhos family, they just flew out to California. Can I tell you every time we go to and fro, we're fulfilling Bible prophecy. Isn't that amazing? You say, is it wrong to take a vacation? Absolutely not. You better go while we get you while you got a chance. Amen. So it's obvious that we are living in the last of the last days. And we'll get more description in these signs as the series goes on. We'll get in more detail and so on. But for now, quickly, another description of what the last days would look like. Let's go to 2 Timothy, the third chapter. And we're not going to get into a whole lot of details in this message. But I just kind of want to get you excited about the series here today. 2 Timothy... Let's see what the Apostle Paul has to say to his son in the faith, Timothy, here. 2 Timothy 3.1. But know this. Everybody say, know this. In other words, we just don't think, hope so, surmise, but we can know this. Know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. And Paul just begins to list or detail what it's going to look like. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. Anybody recognize any of these things? Okay, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong. Oh, my goodness, we could park right there. Headstrong, haughty, <laughs> lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Mm -hmm. Wow, boy, it's easy to do, isn't it? Having a form of godliness but denying its power. And that really describes the, the religious church of today, doesn't it? Having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. How far am I reading? Verse number five, that was it. Having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. That's today. Somebody say that's, just, that's today. That's Sunday, July 16th, 2017. It's just amazing that Paul could look down the telescope of time and see our day and age. Amazing. So then, we see a perfect description here by Paul of the day and age in which you and I now live. But yet, isn't it amazing with all these signs around us and all the prophecies being fulfilled, isn't it amazing how the world still refuses to believe that we are living in the last days? Isn't that amazing? I mean, you say something to somebody about the last days and they're like, ugh! Yeah, I'm one of them. I'm liable to go up in the rapture, so you better watch out, Jack. Who are you talking to? And they get an attitude with you like you something crazy. They're the one that's crazy. Amen? But how can you live in this world and, and know the Bible? But see, that's the problem right there. They don't know the truth. They don't know the Word of God. Can I tell you, you, you can't live in this world and know the Word of God and not see the signs. They're so obvious. So obvious. But what, what's worse than the world not seeing it is the church denying it. 
Let me say that again. You might want to write that down. What's worse than the world not seeing it is the church denying it. Well, you know, we're in this to build our kingdom. We're in this to do whatever, you know. I've heard about this my whole life. I'm going to stop talking about it. I'm going to stop preaching about it. What's even worse than the world denying it is when preachers, ministers, pastors, evangelists won't even preach about the last days anymore. You say, well, there's been abuse and preachers stand up and set dates and this and that. Again, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If there's any message that needs to be preached in the last days, guess what? It's about the last days. Here, stop, time out. Let's just think like the devil for a minute. Oh, I know we're supposed to have the mind of Christ. Sometimes you gotta, you, you got to think the way the devil thinks to out-trick him, to out-smart him. If you were the devil, don't look at your neighbor right now. Just saying. But if you were the devil, what would be one of the greatest things that you would want to mess up in these end times? The end time message. You would want to get the church so distracted about building the church and the kingdom and that we don't even mention that it's the last days anymore. I'm just saying. Can I tell you that the fact that we don't even talk about the last days anymore is a sign that it's the last days? Let's look at it. I've got scripture for it, 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up the pure minds by way of reminder. Everybody say reminder. How many know sometimes we just need to be reminded about some things? Right? That you may be mindful of the words that which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers might come. There's a pretty good chance that they're going to show up. Know that scoffers will come. And, will, and when will they come? In the last days. Walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continued as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, Jesus hasn't come yet, so I don't think he's coming. Well, if you know anything about the word of God, you understand the fact that his first coming was prophesied by the prophets of old. Correct? And guess what? He came the first time. He came as a babe in the manger. He came as Mary's little lamb. So guess what? If he came the first time, then that means he's coming the... Because the same book that says he came the first time says he's coming the second time. Right? But can I tell you, this time he's not coming as Mary's little lamb. But he's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah, of king of kings and lord of lords. Come on, somebody. Look at your neighbor and say, you better get ready, honey. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Did we read it? Yeah, we read it. My goodness, Lord, help me stay focused. One of the greatest deceptions, I believe, in the last days is the fact that people, and perhaps even Christians, will say the Lord has delayed his coming. We don't understand the last, time, the last day's message. We get it wrong, so we're not even going to talk about it. That's what the enemy wants us to do. Okay? And you know what? If we don't understand it, then we better get back in the book again. Right? We better start praying it through, studying it out, and that's what we're doing. We're talking about the signs of the times. Now, in order to lay a proper foundation for this series, and like I said, I have no idea how many messages there, there's going to be in this series. But who knows, maybe we'll just continue to Jesus comes back. Is that all right? <laughs> but uh, we're just going to be led of the Holy Spirit. But in order to prepare a proper foundation for this series, first of all, we must understand where we are here today. Think about that. Where are we here today in 2017? In order for us to know where we are here today, first of all, we must recall the fact that on the day of Pentecost, 
back in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Ghost was poured out, how many remember the story? On those 120 in the upper room in Jerusalem, on the day of Pentecost, the early, the early church, everybody say the early church, the early church birthed the church age into existence. Now, how many times have we heard in the church the last several years or so that God is wanting to birth something through his church? Have you heard that a lot? I've heard that a whole lot. And so what I'm just throwing out there is, is this, and I know the Lord wants us to birth more than just one thing. Presumably his will upon the earth is one of them. But if the apostles, the early church, birthed the church age into existence, how important is it for us, the last day's church, to birth the end of this thing? And when I say that, I'm not just talking about the closing of a dispensation, but rather what God wants to do at the closing of the dispensation. How many see it? Okay. Let me just give a little reminder here. How many understand the apostles aren't here anymore? We're still living in the same age, but they birthed this age. But they're not here anymore, but we are. Look at your neighbor and tell them, but we are. You know what that means? That means God has called us to do this thing. How many feel that weight of that right there? God has called us, the last day's church, to close out this dispensation. And if that don't wake you up, then you're not, you're not going to wake up. This age or dispensation is also known as the age of grace or the age of the Holy Spirit. Quickly, let's look at it here in Acts chapter 1. We'll just kind of touch on it real quick. The beginning of this age in which we now live today. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power. Everybody say power. power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Fast forward to chapter 2, verse number 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, notice it had to fully come. They had to wait upon it. In fact, they had to wait how many days in the upper room? They had to wait 10 days in the upper room. Now, let me ask you this. If God told us to come to FGEC building right here and wait 10 days, would we be willing to do it? Remember, he, he appeared to 500, but only 120 were counted in the upper room. Man, i got to keep going. Lord, help me. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled. Everybody say all. all. Not some, not most, not just the leadership, not just the apostles, but all were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of them gave them utterance. Now, let me just throw this in here real quick for those who don't believe in the manifestations of the gifts and the Spirit. If we are in the same age that the apostles were when they spoke in tongues and were filled with the Holy Ghost, shouldn't we be still doing the same thing they were? If they were healing the sick, raising the dead, going on, laying hands, doing all these great and mighty things, shouldn't we be doing the same thing if we're living in the same age they were? Okay. All right. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, verse number 5, and they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language which we were born? Skip down to verse number 12. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying one to another, What could this mean? Others mocking said they are full of new wine. Well, yeah, really they were. Verse 14, but Peter standing up on the 11, with the 11, raised up his voice and said, now remember Peter? Man, I got so much stuff I need to bring out. Remember Peter before Pentecost? What was Peter? Coward. Denied Christ at least three times. But after the Holy Ghost came upon him, he got bold as a lion and he's going he's gonna to stand up and preach the first church age message. Come on, somebody. Somebody say, thank God for the Holy Ghost. 
Man, that's what the Holy Ghost does for you. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it is about the third hour of the day or about nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. I like what the King James says. This is that. Woo, everybody say, this is that. That it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And upon my men servants and all my handmaidens, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Wow. That was the beginning of the church age. And church, can I tell you, the church age has not stopped. We're still living in it. So we should be acting the way the apostles acted. We should be living as the early church lived. How many would say amen? Now, the neat thing about all of this is, is the fact that you and I here some 2,000 years later, 2017, we are writing church history. Think about that. The same age or dispensation which the apostles lived in after Pentecost is the same age or dispensation you and I live. If you go to the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you go to the four Gospels, you will find an amen at the close of each and every one of those books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. What comes after John? Acts. And is it, and is it just the acts of the apostles? No, it's the acts of the Holy Spirit working in the apostles. But if you go to the book of Acts, chapter 28, verse 31, the last scripture in the book of Acts, you will find no amen at the close of Acts. There's an amen in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but when you get to Acts, there's no amen. You say, is that an accident, coincidence? No, that means that the church age is still going on. We're still living in that dispensation that the apostles birthed. And can I say, we're, we're not mere disciples. Maybe we are when we first come to Christ, but we're called to be apostles. Look at your neighbor and tell them, you're called to be an apostle, a leader of the church, a leader of the church. We're still living, we're still writing church history. Some 2,000 years ago, some 2,000 years after Pentecost, we're still living in that same age. Now, let me just say this. If the age or the dispensation started, the church age, the age of grace, the age of the Holy Spirit, if that church age in which we live right now, if it started with a bang on the day of Pentecost, can I tell you right now it's going to go out with a bang? God is not going to allow His church to just limp off into eternity, I promise you. I mean, we might as a church, we might not have the victory in Lincoln if we choose so, but I'm telling you, the church as a whole is going to have victory. Come on, somebody. We're going to go out with a shout. We're going to go out with a bang. And the world is going to know that we were here. And I just believe revival is coming. I believe there's great one more great move of God that's coming. I believe there's one more great awakening that's coming. I believe it. I believe it. But now, what all this simply means is this. The last days actually began 2,000 years ago. And so that puts us here in 2017 living in the last of the last days. And that's why I'm always saying that. We're not just living in the last days, but we're living in the last of the last days. So now you know why we say that. Now, quickly, we're just barely scratching the surface here in this first message. But hopefully this is beginning to whet your appetite for what's to come. Are you excited about this series? Amen. Come on, if you'll be excited, I'll, I'll study a lot harder and I'll preach a lot better. I even put a suit on today. Some of you think I preach better with a suit on, so I put a suit on today so I could preach, Brother Gabe. You like that? All right. <laughs> But before we close here today, I want to ask a question. And I want you not to, not to just only think about it, 
but I want you to actually go home and study it out. Will you do your homework with me? We have two weeks to do this. But the question I want to ask us is, is this. What is the greatest sign? What is the greatest sign that the generation in which you and I li now live, what is the greatest sign that we have seen? What is the greatest sign or signs of the last 100 years? Just to give you a clue, we've talked about a couple of them real quick here today. But in two weeks, we're going to really get into this uh, detail about it. Now, so today we're not going to answer that question. But we will provide you with the answers to that in the second message. Remember, the Morgan family's here next weekend. And then two weeks from today, we will be back in our series. But so as we close here today, I want to give you one more scripture here in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, and hopefully today has just been kind of a, a refreshing, a refresher course in the last days. And like I said, there's going to be so much more, so many more details, handouts, videos, scriptures. But look at this in Hebrews chapter 1, verse, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God, who at various times and in various ways, how many know God will find any way to get your attention? Was it David that said, though I make my bed in hell, you are there? Hmm. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets and has in these what? Hmm. Okay. By the prophets and in these last days spoken to us by his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. And so, here we see the writer of Hebrews calling their time the last days. So there it is, just a reassurance that the last days actually started back then, and that puts us at the last of the last days. Saying that God had spoken to them by His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, if Jesus was the greatest sign to the world, even though the world didn't know who He was, even though, even though the world didn't recognize him. Come on, somebody. Even though the world didn't accept him, just like they won't accept us and our end time message. Does anybody see the correlation here? Okay, man. If Jesus was the greatest sign to the world in his time, then what is the greatest sign or signs not only to us but to the world today? Now, I'm going to tell you what that is in the next message. But can I give you a little clue right here? I'll give you, some, I'll give you a little bone. If Jesus Christ was the greatest sign to the world at his time, Guess who should be the greatest sign to the world at this time? You, Pastor Steve? No, us, honey, the church. Because guess what? Jesus isn't here anymore. The apostles aren't here anymore, but we are, and we're writing church history. Is anybody excited about that? Listen, when this is all said and done and we're in heaven talking about this, what are they going to say about us? Well, the church of Lincoln, the church of Lincoln did what? Did we do signs and wonders? Did we do great things or did we kind of... Can I tell you it's up to us? Yeah, Lord help us. Ooh, Jesus, Lord help me. How many can say, Lord help me? How many know we got our work cut out for us? Oh, I'm right there with you. Don't get me wrong. I'm right there. I'm a fellow struggler. I'm right there with you. We, we got our work cut out for us. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. For no weapon formed against us shall prosper. For if God be for us, who can be against Christ in us, the hope of glory? 
Greater things. Everybody say greater things. Not less than, not equal to, but greater things shall you do in my name because I go to the Father. Can I tell you, he was talking to us when he made that statement. Why? Because we're living in the same church age. And honey, if this doesn't excite you, then you can't get excited. We're living in the last of the last days. So, man, I just, I just gave you some of my next message. Lord, help me. So go home. Do your homework. Then in two weeks, we're going to talk about the greatest signs of the last 100 years. Now, did I say that was my last scripture? Well, I was lying. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. Told you I wasn't perfect. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know. Everybody say no. Know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Woo! That's going to be good. Everybody ready to shout? Yeah. I saved my best point for last. Is that good? Okay, man, I'm ready to shout. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then comes sudden destruction upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, as they shall not escape. Oh, my goodness. How many know we're pregnant? How many know we're pregnant with purpose today? Come on, somebody. Woo, we're pregnant with a promise. We're pregnant with a move of God that he's trying to birth in this world. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren... Watch this, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light. Where am I supposed to be reading to? Verse number 9. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober. Okay. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not, yeah, Timmy, you're about to get this, ain't you? All right, thank you. I, I preached somebody happy today. Woo, thank you, Jesus. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, that's what gives me hope that we can get out of here before the tribulation starts, that God has appointed us to wrath. Man, you can stick around and go through the tribulation if you want to. Now, the key verse in this passage was verse number 4. Look what Paul said here in verse number 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Everybody say this day. This day. And what day are we talking about? Well, quickly, let's back right up to chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. But I do not want you to be... Praise team, come on. I'm finishing, I promise. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, man, I'm getting ready to run right now. I can feel the Holy Ghost. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means proceed those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall see, be always with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Can somebody say amen this morning? So then, the day that should not overtake us as a thief is the day that Jesus will return for his church. The only people that it's going to come for as a thief in the night are those who aren't looking for him. How many remember the story? The ten virgins. Five were wise. Five were foolish. Did they go out? Did the five foolish go out and be sinful and Live a crazy life, talk crazy, act crazy. No, they just simply let the oil run out. Did you get that? The five foolish virgins 
The five that were left behind, the only thing they did wrong was let the oil run out. And what does the oil represent? That's why we can't deny the Holy Ghost. And so my question to you is this. I'm quitting. If you and I as born-again, spirit-filled believers, if the day Jesus is to return will not overtake us as a thief, then does that mean we can actually know the day when he's going to return? I'm going to make you think in this series, I promise you. I'm going to make you think. You better get your thinking cap on. You better go back to the Word and study it again. Because remember the, the Scripture, it says, for in them you think you have eternal life. Honey, you better know so. And I'm going to tell you, we're going to say some things in this series that you better be ready to receive. Are you going to be ready to receive by the help of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> and I know what you're thinking. That verse says, no man knows the hour or the day. But I tell you what, God has showed us something about that as well. So stay tuned. Be back here in two weeks. Next week, the Morgan family will be here. How many are excited about the fact that Jesus is soon to return? And like I said, listen, if he doesn't come back soon, we will be in the tribulation. We will be in the tribulation. I have a video to show you here in a few weeks. We've already talked about the solar eclipse coming up in August. How many have heard about the date in September? September 23rd. Well, don't worry about it. If you haven't seen it, don't even worry about looking it up. I'm, we're going to show it to you. It's amazing. It's amazing. The star of Bethlehem. The star of Bethlehem has only appeared three times in human history. And can I tell you the star of Bethlehem is right out there right now. Only the third time in human history. It has a two-year window, and we're living in it right now. Church, I'm telling you, just take my word for it if you don't want to study it for yourself. I promise you, we're living in the last of the last days. Let's stand. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I just pray that each and every one of us here today, and those who are viewing live and at a later date over the internet, YouTube, and Facebook. God, that you would speak to our hearts. That you would stir our hearts to repentance. Father, I believe one of the greatest attacks or the tricks that the enemy uses today is simply distraction. To distract us with the cares of life and making a living Lord, oftentimes it's not, it's not even bad things. It's just the cares of life and sobriety and making a living and going to school and going to work. And Lord, what happens when we do that? Lord, throughout our daily routine, our weekly routine, our monthly routine, Lord, you, you just kind of get pushed back to the side. And Lord, forgive us when we do that. Lord, I pray in this series that you would stir our hearts, that you would whet our appetite about the end times, last days message. Father, give us ears to hear. Lord, you said it so many times in Revelation through John the Revelator. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is speaking to the church. Father, just have your way in our lives today, we pray. Would you just come and join me and 